online listening as well. So by the way, go to our website. We will have actually all the very detailed data for that population forecast by age cohort on our website, hopefully um, by December. Uh, I just have to go and build this whole, whole system so you can then interact with it, the latest data. But you can go to our website and social media. We, we really like the, the KSE Con. That way we can have the dialogue. I encourage you to take pictures or even do screenshots so the presentation should also be online as well so you can get that that way. All right, well, I have to say thanks for our sponsors. They really are covering a lot of our costs, particularly this year, which uh, they're, they're definitely helping out. Evergy, uh, Kansas Health Foundation, which actually helped also do pay for the population forecast. And then Helgerson's a big uh, company down in Wichita helping with a lot of the entertainment. You stay, you know, you're a little close, but, <laughs> but you're wearing your mask, so you can actually stay close as you're wearing your mask. Uh, all right, let's see if we can get this. Let me try one more time with my. Need to... If just in case you wanted to come and you want to do this, if you want to forecast the S&P 500, you can put it in and we've done this for the last three, four years. Anyone else who's online can do this as well. And you can come to the, our big event, which was last year. We had Esther from the Kansas City Fed there. We had the chief economist from the SBA that came for, from there. So we had all this. This I had them before we had PPP loans. And so you could talk about PPP loans and things like that. Uh, and next year, we always bring in national economists, things like that, to talk about a whole bunch of different sectors. So if that's of interest, you can definitely do that. All right. Uh, so I guess the first thing I need to do is well, before I get into it, uh, let me start a little bit. Uh, I know when I came back, it was in February when I came, right? Is that when I came? Uh, I shared that my mother grew up in Atchison, and I didn't, I never knew where her address was, so I did find her house last night, took a picture of her house. It was uh, 811 3rd Street, right? Yeah, so you might know where that is. So anyway, I found that, that was one of the houses that she lived in. She even graduated high school from Atchison, so. Her main name, Binning, but they've been gone for so long. So, so I don't know. They didn't have history here prior to that. It was just uh, her father moved here um, and then I think I married and had their kids. And then then they were out pretty quickly after that. They went actually to Oklahoma after that. So anyway, so yeah, I don't think there's other family ties at all that I know in this area, but I do have family that homesteaded in Kansas. So I do have family across the state, although Almost all of my immediate family, actually the year I moved back to Kansas, they all left. So I really don't have any immediate family in Kansas anymore, although I have, you know, from, from that side, mostly in Western Kansas. Um, anyway, this last six months have been nothing but just six months of crazy for me. I mean, we were talking earlier, uh, all I do every day is answering all these questions about what's going on. Uh, so there's really no way I can even begin to put everything I've researched or talked about into a presentation. So uh, definitely have a dialogue. And Andrea, since you're listening, if you want to send me a text message, I'll check my, my phone. That'd be easier than trying to um, look over at the screen at the same time. That'd be a little harder for me to do. So if you want to relay a, a question that someone had online, we can do it that way. I asked my favorite hashtag this year, by the way, just to get you going if you want to do social media, was doom scrolling. How many people know what that is here? You haven't heard of this? You're just not on social media. <laughs> so, so doom scrolling, and you probably did it, is when you get on your phone and start looking for the next doomsday news. We've all, you're right, you've all been doing this thing. That's one of my favorite ones. I asked my two teenagers their favorite, and quarantine that fits really well for Kansas, and mask knee, which was really trending there for a while, which is mask acne. So you know, teenagers are wearing it so much they're getting acne on it. So. Anyway, you definitely use uh, Kansas Econ and to, to do that, and you can do it on social media. It looks like I'm gonna have to work on this a little bit more. I'm gonna have to, oh, there we go. Right when I go to, to do it. All right, this is what I forecasted at this time last year, but then we have to, I always do this, bring up the previous forecast, but then we gotta talk about what happened when I came last time, and I remember the details. 
But last year at this time, I thought the Kansas economy was going by 6.6%. You gotta say, what was I thinking? Actually, I spent all of last year saying, when's the next recession? What's the next recession? And I pushed it out to the audience. It had lots of people give me input. No one could come up with it. Matter of fact, when I did a survey preparing last year, the majority of businesses said we were gonna have a recession in 2020. They were right, but no, but they weren't right because they knew it. So last year I spent all this time thinking of health checkup. What are the fundamentals behind the economy? And, and I still stick, we could have grown, we could have grown by still quite a bit. We had a couple more, several more years of growth because there really wasn't an economic bubble, right? That really was the concern. There wasn't anything really out of line that, and I still don't think there was anything really that out of line that would put a concern where we'd say, okay, it's time for a correction. Now, fast forward to when I came in February, we had the same conversation. And then I said, oh, but there's other things that happened. And uh, the 737 was weighing down the state. So it went from 0.6% to 0.4% in the state because all that machine manufacturing across the state, they were already feeling the losses in that aerospace. I mean, it was a big, big dive. Um, and then we had this conversation because we heard about this thing called COVID and we had this conversation about it. And I said, well, look, it all bets off now on my forecast is what I shared with you because that was coming. But I, I remember what I shared. We have a very robust health system and that it could, we shouldn't discount that. Obviously, and we found out now the president knew that we, there was no way we were gonna get past it. And, and I was wrong on that, on that comment about we might be able to get through COVID a little bit faster. Look at the preview one, SARS, things like that. We had a better control over it. This one just completely changed it. But I did share, hey, I, our forecast just went out the window because of all this. They might even talked about, and I don't remember if that was in my presentation about black swan events. Did I share that? So in forecasting, you have a thing called a black swan event. And Kansas had two, or well, the US had another one too, two events. So the first one, something is so unique, so unusual, that is a black swan. How many people have seen a black swan? You've seen a black swan? Well, you got rid of part of my joke on this. The idea is most people don't ever see a black swan. It is very, it's supposed to be very rare. Well, the first one is something you would never even include in forecast is 737 max and then COVID, right? So you had these two black swan events that really shake it up. But if you actually look at it, black swans have increased in population by quite a bit. They're not as rare as they used to be. Um, so. And that is probably really, when you think about the economy, a lot of these things we think is so unusual, you're gonna have to start incorporating these really highly unusual events that could derail an economy. Uh, if you think about it in banking and stuff, it could just derail your economy qu pretty quickly. And we gotta start thinking more and more about those black swan events. All right, so that's, that's the background of it. Oh, we're just really, all right, I'm gonna have to give up on the, Remote. All right. So um, I was thinking about a theme for this year because last year was a health checkup, and you didn't see that when I did it in the fall and the uh, back in the um, February. So I usually you do big themes when I do it go out this time of year. So this health checkup, and I talked about blood pressure and related all the economy. So this year, I was thinking about the theme of the event, and there's only one thing that really stuck to me. And it's a Shakespearean tragedy, right? Where you just feel this is one thing after another completely going through. And all Shakespearean tragedies are broken up into how many acts? Five, they're always five acts. So I broke up my presentation in five acts. And when you think about supernatural forces, which is always a theme in all the tragedies that you're talking about Hamlet, I didn't share it last night, but you have Hamlet, you have ghosts, you have Macbeth, you have witches. And for 2020, what do we have for our supernatural force? It's COVID. So when I first start this, I thought we'd really break down and look at all those COVID related issues. And in particular, when you're doing all that doom scrolling, because I know you did it, but you're already nodded to doing it. We need to put a reality check. How much of that was real? How much of that do we really happened? And how do we put it in context? Because you saw a lot of headline news, but how do we get to it? So this one first looks at the biggest industries at the national level. And it says if January was 100%, right when we really got in the full of it in April, you can see that leisure and hospitality dropped all the way down to 51%. That means it lost 49%. And then if you move forward today, it goes all the way back up to 76%. So nowhere near where it was on the employment side. The one sector that really 
completely missed COVID was banking, right? They were too busy putting out PP loans and refinancing home mortgages and things like that. They wouldn't even know if they were fired because they were too busy working late nights trying to keep up with the market and all the changes in it. Now, when you look at different groups of the population, and you've heard some of these stories, there are a lot of truths to it. So for example, females were more impacted by COVID and minorities were highly impacted by COVID and people with lower education rates were impacted. Most of this was driven that leisure and hospitality sector. It was related those people who were in those sectors were the ones that were highly impacted because they required to be more in the public or more in those sectors that were shut down. Uh, now the question is, especially if you have more of this teleworking world and urban de-densification and this automation forcing, which automation forcing, by the way, is you take these highly risk jobs and you just go to automation because there's too much risk. There's too much cost to pay them to do in those positions. So a trend that's been going on. If those factors really do continue and you lose some of those professional services, what I mean by professional services, those people then the banking jobs and accountants and things like that, and you lose the support jobs behind it because they're working from home or all these other factors, we have a big issue that's brewing on the national economy, right? What could happen? You could have this decrease in upward social mobility, right? Think about those support jobs. Someone is trying to move up in their career and so they work as a, as a administrative assistant or they're working as um, in the hospitality just to get through college or they're working for security and they use that just to pay for college or some higher education and move up in their career. So there's a big concern that we're gonna lose social mobility. But if you know anything about Shakespeare, Shakespeare and I, this is perfect for you, right? And every single play, the beginning of the play, is, the environment is very different than the end. And this is a great example. We cannot look in the past. So if this was before COVID and this trend was happening, I would say, yes, we have a big issue of social mobility and movement in labor but I'm gonna spend the next few slides saying, hey, we should actually twist this and there's a different environment in front of us. All right, this one is so fantastic, it's so cool. I, and I want you to look at this, take this in. Oh, you can't even see this. So you won't, well, people online will have to look at it. Maybe you can see it over here. I'm not playing any tricks. There is, this is, goes all the way down to zero. So this high growth in personal income went through the roof in second quarter. And so when you look at the components of personal income, right right in the middle when you do the shutdown, income went up to the highest level. If you look at components, I only put two of them on here. One was earnings, right, earned income. You have wages going consuming the economy and it looks like it dropped by a little, but it dropped by a lot. Wage income dropped by a whole lot. And then if you go over here and looked at this other one, transfer of receipts. So what happened? It is unemployment insurance at the federal level and state level that just flew into the economy to help stabilize this economy, right? There's other ones on here, but um, rent dividends and uh, earn, other earned income, uh, just for such a small part, farm income, they were all removed from this because they don't really affect it. It was really transfer of receipts. I mean, this is shocking, right? So if you think about, how, and you were starting to lead into this, Dan, earlier, think about how the economy was feeling over the summer, starting to feel like it was recovering, and especially you going into the fall, we got to keep in mind, a lot of this floated because of federal transfer of receipts, particularly unemployment insurance, right? Unemployment insurance, it doesn't matter which political party you're on, most economists say this is the most effective and efficient way of stabilizing an economy. Now, we would disagree, a lot of people would disagree that $600 is going to be efficient and effective, but just the unemployment insurance is going to be uh, very efficient. Well, it dropped off in July. So if you fast forward and look at the monthly one, I don't have it for Kansas, so I didn't show it, but right after July, transfer receipts dropped. In August, it's dropped, right? And it's gonna continue to drop. So what's floating the economy as we went into August, right? If we lost all this transfer of receipts, savings. Savings rate went all the way up through the roof, right? We had all this cash. What's been floating the economy is consumers are kind of lagging, right? They are saying, oh, I have this cash in my pocket. I've been saving. I'm now gonna start feeling better because I think that no matter what they really, they understand what's happening to COVID cases, they're out there spending a little bit more. And because they're spending a little bit more, they're feeling a little better, but they're about to get a big shock, right? And I say that is because 
inherent in my forecast later is we need a federal stimulus. That's why the Federal Reserve came and said it. That's why even both Republican House recognize it, but we're gonna run into a big problem if we don't get it and we don't get it really soon. And I didn't look at the news last night or this morning if something else has transpired on that, but um, background on that. Okay, so the impact on Kansas, I have really good news. So the impact on the employment side of Kansas was a lot less than the nation. But if you saw, if you saw any of the stuff that I put out, back in April we were asked to do an impact study we said uh oh kansas is going to be impacted really hard particularly some of these places that have durable manufacturing like wichita we said the supply chain issues and the trade issues and overall demand it's just going to crush those areas right and so i said we're going to lose even we're i thought we we're going to lose more my forecast for that we put out in may for kansas was for kansas to grow to decline by 10.2 percent so the first question is, why was I wrong on employment? Because actually, I think I'm right, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm wrong on the employment side. Uh, on the employment side, what happened? First, when I had, to, I had to make assumptions, those PPP loans, I had to make assumption that we were gonna get the exact same number per, per capita, for, per business in that case, than every other state would have for based on businesses. Now that we said we're gonna get the uh, stimulus checks, the same rate the rest, of this, the rest of the US would. And I didn't have it on here, but if you wanna see the slides, I can show you. We actually got a lot more PPP loans because some were the hardest hit, but we also have small and medium banks that were, they had personal relationships that were more aggressive and getting it out to those people that needed it. So we ended up getting a lot more, which then took a direct effect and saved some jobs. Uh, and then the stimulus checks, because of we were already filing more on time and we filed at the right timing, we had a lot more stimulus checks that came in that flooded into this state than other states, which I did just didn't expect. Uh, so those had saved. Another one, which I'll show you later, is businesses in Kansas were more cap, better capitalized than the rest of the nation, right? They had more cash on hand, so they could float their business. When you go back and look at the employment, and I did a panel discussion, the reason why they didn't lay as many people off, they were already pretty tight. We just, I had the crew I need to keep just to be successful six months, a year from now, and so they were less likely to lay off earlier on. But you already can start seeing that in the state, well, across the state, even at the state, the U.S. is coming back because they did a full layoff. We were holding on, and now we're seeing that demand's not quite there, and so we're struggling now when the U.S. is starting to improve a little bit more. So my first indication that when I had to take a guess, it was somewhat right. All right, now COVID has this big shadow on the economy. This is not like a normal economic recession where there's a bubble, right? There's a bubble, we now see it because you can't see it until it happens. Then you, the market corrects and you go forward, right? We have a shadow of COVID. It's going to hang over us until we get a clear vaccine and dissemination of this. Now, if you should really check this out. They pay these people at good judgment, not because they're experts in the medical field. They get paid for accuracy and they do all these forecasts. And they have some really great, some great forecasts and accuracy in all the things that they're doing. So I use this as a great a way of predicting what will happen. So right now, based on all the information out there, we have a 53% of the respondents think that we'll have a vaccine by the end of the school year and another 38% by the beginning of next school year. So, I mean, let that sink in. We've got a long ways to go based on the information out there that we're not going to be out of this anytime soon. It could be all the way into the next year before we have a real confirmation. All right, so the first act I said, supernatural forces. If you think about in all Shakespeare's plays, the supernatural force is never the main theme. It's, it just is used to build your hero and look at the character flaws in the hero, right? Just for Kansas, it feels like COVID is everything in Kansas is all about Kansas right now or your business, right? That's all you do every day is think about COVID, but it's just finding those issues within Kansas particularly households, what's going on in households, what's going on in your business, where are those weak clients out there, right? That's what all it's doing is finding those weaker areas in this economy. So if we put it in that perspective, which I'm gonna flip over and talk about households, we can think about it a little bit different. First, unemployment, uh, this is unemployment rates. The national level, we were up to 14.7% back in April, dropped to eight. Better way to look at this, we lost 22 million jobs at the US level. We brought back 11 million. So there's still 11 million people out there that are unemployed. 
we've improved, but there's still people unemployed. Same thing across the state. Now, I like this lens of looking at unemployment. What I did here is unemployment, initial unemployment claims. And I divided that initial unemployment claims by per thousand people in that sector. So I normalized it so you can really see who's being impacted the most. And I wanna show you three completely different labor markets. Go all the way back to January, the first one. And you can see right here, construction, 5.6. So if for every thousand construction workers in Kansas, 5.6 had unemployment claims. Well, this is off season. This is not seasonally adjusted. This is a sign of a very tight labor market. For a thousand people, there's really no one available for a job. There, we're not laying people off at all. Move forward to the highest peak when we had this big increase in initial unemployment claims all in March. And you see a different scenario. This is when we shuttered the economy, shut everything down, Manufacturing per 1,000 workers, almost 85 people. Come down here to the accommodations is over almost 92, a little over 92 people per 1,000 people that were impacted, right? Is the labor market because we shut it down? Now we move forward to the most recent data and it's actually different, right? Things have shifted, demand has shifted, right? And so you see a very different labor market. There's sectors over here that, although they were high, the shift and burden of who's doing the layoffs is in a different sector. I'm gonna tell you right now, if we move forward to January this year, it's gonna be different again, right? And it's gonna to continue to change. And I wanna make that distinction because we feel like we're still under COVID and it's still the same thing, but it, the, as a labor side of hiring and firing and the businesses who are struggling today, it keeps changing and is very dynamic than it was before. By the way, if you stop me, if you have a question, you got lots of stuff. All right, uh, unemployment, here's, we talked earlier, here's another lens of saying, let's look at different subgroups and it's a different story in Kansas. Initial unemployment claims for gender, they're both high for male and female. Remember how I said the labor market keeps changing? Male is increasing now than it was before. Why? It's that manufacturing base. Manufacturing is really taking a hit today. Come down here, gender or uh, to race. At the national level is just minorities and here it's not overall minorities, it's one race that's being impacted the most per 1,000 black is being impacted the most at the peak and even, to even today, still a higher rate of being impacted. A lot of the same sectors. Now the two on the right side might surprise you. On the right side, when you look at today, who's being impacted, people later in their career and people with more education, with bachelors and more, are the ones that are being impacted. It's showing you that there is a shift in, in who's being laid off. Really that demand's going down and now other sectors. Now you look at total volume, it's a lot less, but the impact per person, there's more. Takeaway, if you're a business, particularly here, and I don't think we had this conversation. Yeah, we didn't have this conversation last time, but last year I had a lot of communities, especially in communities your size saying, I need talented labor. I can't get them. I can't get them. Well, guess what? Right now is the time to get it. Matt, Well, the movement, and I'm going to come back to it a little bit, how you get them and how do you engage them? <laughs> no, no. Oh. So those people online, you didn't hear the, this comment from Jonathan. He's saying that you get them, but they would, might leave right from here or it just it's just not still finding that quality labor is that correct okay I, just relaying so they can hear it i'm going to come back to it so i'm going to keep that in the back of your mind because i'm going to come back and try to put it more in context of how things have actually shifted to communities your size and and then give you a whole nother dynamic at the end because i think things are going to change but it's not going to be the way you're thinking right now it's not that they're going to be yeah, you, I, I hold me accountable for everything I say. <laughs> I love it. So I, I like people to dis disagree because then we all, we all see the complexity of the economy, right? This one is interesting. So the census, and there's tons of data out there. The census did a survey, been doing survey for a while of households. They look at anxiety, depression, finances, and, and food scarcity. If you looked at all of them, I looked at all of them. I was gonna show you all these slides, I just didn't have time. 
you can see that Kansas and the U.S. go up. It's peaked and kind of going up and down, depends on what's going on out there, anxiety and depression. Uh, but for all of them, the good news is that we have less response, response, respondents to issues than the nation. So good news, our households are doing better for the most part, except for this one. So I thought I would tease this out and show it to you. Food scarcity. If someone was laid off in Kansas or furloughed, we had a whole lot more furloughs in Kansas. We were trying to keep that labor, so we did more of the furloughs, which is great. We were working off some of that um, liabilities that we had on our balance sheets, which is working it off, and it kept them employed. But you can see that we have more people that did not have enough to eat. Now, this comes back to a community issue of saying, okay, hey, if we got people who are really struggling in Kansas not to eat, what's going to happen to crime? What's going to happen to those kids in schools and learning? What's going to happen to re-engagement in the labor market in the future, right? This is, this is something to consider, right? And there's still a sizable group of people out there that are, are struggling on the food side of this. But keep in mind, for the most part, we're doing a lot better. Uh -huh. across America or whatever, our Salvation Army has been feeding our community. I mean, just the amount of food that we're able to provide present in, in our county. I don't want to talk mm -hmm. about county. I mean, you're looking yeah. at the state. Yeah. Um, there is plentiful. I mean, it's, it's amazing in our Salvation Army right that we had an event to help them get rid of the food, and it was going to people like me. Uh -huh. So it's just amazing how yeah, they're all applied for grants. It varied. I mean, you know, certainly by the state, you can see where that, that trend is up. But within our county here, and James, I don't know if you, if you see that, you know, BC, I think BC also had an event where it was giving away food. And, and it's just, it's amazing. So we are very fortunate. In our, 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 just to give you some background. So for those people online, Jonathan was talking about the uh, Salvation Army giving lots of food, really being engaged in the households, and even. Um, uh, the university or college is being engaged getting some food out to it. So I looked, by the way, there's even more detail on that food scarcity. And I was surprised that the networks of systems like Salvation Army and things like that, uh, as I recall, and don't quite quote me on that, I think they were actually more effective in getting food out in Kansas. But what I was surprised by is that what religion was another one and family were less in Kansas. So now, it's two sides of the coin, right? It's because the other one's more efficient that you might have less on the on the uh, churches and things like that and family. But I was a little surprised by the shift in there where it wasn't coming from some of the normal care systems that you just went to the established ones in Kansas. Maybe we have such a great system, we, that's why the other ones weren't effective. Um, but so to your point, yes, the question, let me turn one thing because we don't know this. Did everyone actually even you might, not have, you might have had plenty of food, but to those people who need it, were they willing to accept that food, right? That they could still be out there struggling. Now you can't solve that problem, but I'm just saying that still is a community issue thinking, okay, what could be on crime? Because they are not, maybe there is other social norms here that's preventing them from getting to that food. And that's at the state level too. I don't, that's something I don't know. And I'm not an expert on that one to, to get into. All right, I love this slide. Uh, and if you hear me, since you haven't only been here one time before, I always talk about employment population ratio because it makes a better story and it helps us so much more understand so much more what's going on in the labor market than unemployment rates. And this employment population ratio is easy. I take all employment divided by the total population that's over 18. You can't hide from it. So if we go back before 2008, Kansas and all the markets in it in Wichita were way above the nation. You were here and you were working. You hit the, the Great Recession, we dropped and dropped more than the nation. We were hurt really hard. We had struck, the nation was cyclical. They laid people off and hired them back. We were structural. We kept losing jobs that were never gonna come back in Kansas. And then we had this really flat line. The US kept improving every single year. We were flat for a long time. And finally, you get to 17, where at state, at 17 was really improving, 18 and 19, you see this upward improvement. We were, the market was starting to get a little healthier. We were getting people re-engaged. The, the misconception is, well, they're lazy or they're not out there. They're actually, there have been people out there, it's just they're not matching the labor market and they're not really engaged. 
we get to our peak and then we have a big drop, obviously. And the point I show here is the takeaway is you can look at this two ways. Where were you before coming into COVID? You still have room. There's people really unemployed and out there and available. And two, we could be a lot closer to what Kansas City is. That's a good benchmark. That is a really tight labor market. You can get up to this 52. So any other economy is below it, Kansas or whatever, it shows that we're not utilizing our labor nearly where we could be. Uh, and I even looked at this discounting, people retiring, things like that, not, not, a, not really in there. You're already pushing back. So on this side, employers saying, I have a job and I can't get it filled. I did a panel discussion, they said that I've got jobs I cannot fill. You could say there's people unemployed and I'll come to the other excuse right here, but they're not, I cannot get them. Then households, however, have the exact same story. They're saying, I am putting my job, my application out, and there's too many competing for the same job and I can't get a job. So the question is why? So what's the mystery? So a lot of people want unemployment benefits. I led that earlier saying that $600, guess what I was asked by the workforce center to say what would be, what would happen if we really had the 600? This is right when 600 was being discussed from the federal government, plus our state benefits. And we did a model and it was, I think 78% of Kansans, every single Kansan was better off on unemployment benefits. And I, I sat there and said, oh no, this is bad. Now, part of the 600 is such a, a static number for economies that don't really match what our wages are. So $600 for New York barely covers a lot, but $600 here, ev almost everyone is better not working. So I was really afraid we have this disengagement of the labor market to take on and do rent sinking, it was called, going after that, that free dollar. Um, but a lot of national research already showed that on the margin, of course, people are going to take on, especially the lower income. Why wouldn't you go for it and not be as engaged? But there are twists in that, right? If your employer calls you back, you have to go or you don't get the unemployment benefits. And remember, it dropped off in July and it's been out. And those people who were unemployed, they were not the ones that had the big savings rates that we had before that were paying stuff, right? They're the ones that are struggling day to day. So, so far, that's really not the answer. The answer is actually a little bit easier. The answer is this, we had such a shock to the economy, to this labor market, that it's like when you get ready for Thanksgiving, a lot of people do puzzles with families. It's like taking two sets of puzzles and throwing it on the exact same coffee table. First, you gotta sort out the two puzzles, then you gotta put them back together. Remember when I looked at unemployment population ratio? And I said, hey, we were not really improving. We had that right here, it's called structural change. We had lost jobs, there's people over here with a skill that no longer fit the economy. This just happened again at the national level and it happened here. They don't fit. And that supply and demand, they don't fit within a region and they don't fit within an industry. So you might have labor here. That's why the household says, I can't get a job here because we don't demand you here, but your person's over here somewhere else, right? And so it's gonna take a long time. It's taken years to recover from 2008. We didn't recover. You saw Wichita was way below it should have been. It still hasn't recovered, right? So there's people out there, it's just that friction within the system. That is the easy problem. And unfortunately, it's gonna take a while. All right, so the question you said about, we are pitching it up a little bit about this rural area and urban area. If we take a wide view of the whole state and say, what happened to employment? You can see it just, there was two economies. There was the urban economies that took a big, big hit and they've been coming back. And they have, and by urban, well, you can see the different regions. And then you have the more rural areas. Matter of fact, if I tease this out, and I can, because I have all the data in this really cool tool now, I can pull rural by a different de definition instead of like the urban areas. I can pull other ones. And I did. And you can see areas like this, you've recovered back to where you were. And some of them were actually higher. So why, you're asking, why are they higher? Remember when I said this shift of skills? Those people in this migration of urban areas, they were moving back out to back to rural, right? This is the finally the time when the when some of these other areas of the state said, I've been trying to hire and I can't attract them. Well, now all of a sudden that proper the price of property, the home home um, um, mortgages are great, they're moving. You can move back to a rural area, you can get it paid pretty well. And there was jobs for them out there. So you have a little bit of a shift, not a massive one, but you have a little bit of shift. And, and I think that could continue to happen a, more. So 
a little different shift of those population that was not so negative in the one that you're looking at earlier, Decky. All right, Act Three, this dichotomy of good and evil. And in this, uh, Shakespeare always looks at, at someone like uh, Macbeth, and they start off good, but COVID just over time wears them and he becomes evil, right? Think about our industries. We have great sectors. Even up here in the Kansas City area, there's some great sectors. There's some great sectors over in animal health and machinery manufacturing, food manufacturing. If we go long, the question is, what sectors are going to get really worn down by COVID and start to, to start to decline and have some issues? Now, this breaks all the rules you should have on any slide, but it was so beautiful, I threw it on here anyway. And it's actually simple. The higher the list, these are the highest hit impacted by employment in Kansas. Um, so you can see all this arts, entertainment, and recreation. And the left side is year over year. What's the employment year over year? On the right side is this month over month. You can see right when we hit April, it declined, and it's still below where it was a year ago, right? It's still digging its way out. Negative side. Positive side, it actually took one month. The very next month, they started hiring back. So those hardest hit ones that we keep thinking in our mind, this arts and entertainment and leisure and hospitality, they've been improving. Remember I told you that demand shifted? It's now all these other sectors that are struggling. It's not the hardest hit ones that we keep thinking in our mind. I'm doing this to kind of shift the, dy the dynamic here so we think, okay, it's not those, those anymore. It's actually over here in durable goods and over here in you know, retail trade. Well, we already knew retail trade, but education and professional services, those are now struggling. Right? It's a different kind of environment. All right, remember I told you I thought my impact, we thought Kansas should decline by 10.2%. This is output. If I looked at, and, and I did, at the U.S. level, the U.S. declined by 31%. Kansas declined by 30%. If I look across the state and look at those manufacturing towns, they described by even more huge losses in manufacturing. So when I did my impact side, I did it by output, and I said, yes, manufacturing is going to be hit hard. I actually had healthcare being up pretty high because I knew we were going to lose a lot of the healthcare system, they, those voluntary surgeries, things like that. I knew that was going to be impacted. And I had even had quite a few of these other ones just in the same order. So what happened? So if you took output per employee, we, we should have been closer to that 10%, right? And there's some markets that should have declined a lot more, but we held on to labor. This is that justification of what I was saying. So I'm glad we didn't lose jobs, but that does put us in a different point of how are we using that labor? Is it efficient? Or are we thinking about it the right way? All right, this is a census. They did a business survey, great data, and I've got good news. They said on establishment level, there is less businesses saying they're highly impacted by COVID, so good news. If we weighted this to our drivers to the state economy, it probably changed. It would probably be a little bit more or a lot closer to the nation, but to say good news. And here's just a few variables on the finances. This is where I said, businesses said they were doing really well. They either had other funding, they didn't need it in some ways, and they were well capitalized. So I took that information, plus why didn't we lay more people off like the nation? Are we, we just not being clear-headed about this? Did it the panel? So why aren't you doing this? Because you this doesn't make sense. You should have laid them off. And they said, no, no, we understand the risk. I really need these people. I cannot, I cannot function without these people. I have cash. This will let me be more competitive than my neighbor. So why aren't you making big bets right now of really turning your business and going in a different direction? Because the market's changing. No, it's, and they came back to me and said, no, it's not time. I'm making small bets, lots of small bets, but I'm not going to even pay, make a big bet. Right? I'm going to wait until we get a clear direction, and then I'm going to use my capital, and then and then really put the fuel in the flames and try to grow the grow the business. So, oh, back by the essential definition, yes. Uh huh. Yes. Right, so I have, it's a great question. I got, let me pull that data up. I looked, I did, I did. I pulled the essential and non-essential list uh, by a couple of markets when they asked me to, because it varied a little bit. So I did some stuff with Kansas City over here, over there. I did it for the state. 
And here's the interesting part. Because not only I looked at essential and non-essential businesses in Kansas, I also looked at labor market. You should check my website out. I have this also by the whole state. So you can see uh, by labor. So I looked at how, what percent of your labor had to be physically, physical proximity to someone else to do their job or physical proximity to the area and public serving. So I also looked at this. So how critical was that, was that labor out there to be in the public and then how much was not? Um, and then looked at essential business because that was, that was an important component. So when you combine this two, we did the shutdown. Most of the businesses, except for the hardest hit ones, those required to be out in the public and you had to be physically there, right? Those hard hit ones, those take those out. You look at the rest of them, the shutdown order, those are all those other sectors had a whole lot less being physically present and in proximity. So what, when you did the shutdown order, we just reinforced the fact that me, I went home in April. In April, I took my whole staff home. We worked from home and I love it. I'm never gonna go back to my office. We're gonna shut down, after, as soon as I get done, I'm gonna shut down my whole office. We're gonna go down to one room instead of a whole office suite. I just don't need it, right? I didn't need it. So most of the shutdown order that was not essential, they could work no matter what. It didn't do anything to it. So now you were, I think you're trying to do that in context to finances too. Is that what you're trying to connect? So I don't, there is some data there and I didn't look at the, that segment of finances by industry, but they have some of that at the, at the state level. And I could go back and tease that out a little bit more. I looked at it, but I don't, didn't see anything that was that significant that surprised me uh, that where they were more or less capitalized or these more or less loans in Kansas. Um, but I don't remember that detail, but the story of essential and non-essential, when we really looked at it, at first I said, oh, this is, this is gonna be bad for the economy, but the reality, most of the stuff that was on that non-essential list, they can, they can continue to work no matter what, right? Professional services, most of professional services, now there's some key jobs internally have to do it, but most of professional services could back off, continue to work, and they, and they did. And so it wasn't, when you think about the disruption, it was disruptive, but it wasn't as disruptive as I initially, when I saw that, I was like, oh my goodness, we're gonna shut down the economy get ready for this big, big burden. And it, it was a lot less than I expected when I really started digging down in the detail of how labor is gonna be used, how critical do they need to be there to, to, to function. Uh, it, it really wasn't as much. So I, I do an annual survey, and now you guys haven't seen this before because I didn't share that back in February. Uh, businesses ask them all these questions. There's more detail in your, in your booklet as well, how they answer every year. And you look at, Ask them, volume, yes, it dropped before. Volume's gonna go up, but not for all industries, right? Some of them are gonna really struggle. Input costs could be tough, particularly in manufacturing. They're still saying, this just in time. They converted the whole manufacturing. I mean, this is important. On the food side and non-food side, we've converted to just in time. That means we don't keep stuff, we don't have space to keep stuff. Well, all of a sudden, now you have all this disruption, just in time is killing some businesses. They can't get it out fast enough. They can't store it enough, right? There, that is the issue. So you look at opportunities as the storage that, that kind of reverses just in time. So they have capacity and build that in the cost system is really what's killing a lot of Kansas right now. Prices to the customer, they said, no, we're not increasing next year. What is that gonna do profits? Get ready. Most of them are gonna be flat. Profits are gonna be flat. They think they, they're gonna manage, right? Uh, but increasing number of businesses said, no, we're gonna lose money this next year. There's just no way around it. So keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward to the next slide. Uh, overall employment forecast, I think we're gonna see growth, but you can see the stories building up. I think we're gonna see some growth in a lot of them because we're rebounding. If you break it down here, you can see there's some sectors gonna decline, some gonna grow. Unfortunately, this is too macro for what is really the micro level that's gonna happen. You can have a business in a declining sector that could be successful this next year because they manage their costs. They were very careful on labor and other stuff. Or you can have a business that's just gonna go bankrupt. You can have a business here that's growing in a sector that's gonna rebound. They made a misstep and they could go bankrupt. That's where I see it right now. It's much more on the micro level where it's gonna take community structures, bank systems, the city, the economic developers, a lot of real, a lot of detailed attention. And unfortunately, in some markets across the state, we don't have that enough detailed attention to make sure we help all those 
sectors and all those companies really to make it forward. Uh, so, and it's not necessarily they have a bad model, they just made a small misstep, right? right? All right, act four, fate and fortune. Uh, Shakespeare likes this predestination, but he thinks heroes can kind of choose their direction, right? If you think about Macbeth, he was overly ambitious. Well, our businesses, we have, and I've seen it before in 2008 as well, we're over, we are conservative, right? We do not take high risks. We're not the Macbeth kind of story. We have more of control and we're gonna be careful as we go forward. I was surprised by this. Asked them, are you gonna increase wages? They said, yes, there's a big share of, a lot more than I expected. They're gonna increase wages this next year, despite what's going on. And so I asked them in our panel, I said, why are you doing this? I wasn't here a couple of years ago, previous years are saying wages are going up because they needed that very high skilled labor. That's not the conversation this year. This year they're saying, I need high skilled labor. Yeah, I'm gonna pay them more, but that's not the story. I'm increasing wages for a middle income and lower income because I need them. I really need them. Remember when I talked to you early and said this dynamic of upward social mobility? This is that twist, right? Now we're thinking I'm gonna increase these wages to be competitive, to fill that position in this economy. And it's just shifted to who they're gonna hire and how they're gonna hire going forward. Right, yeah. So the, the question for those online is that, is it just the increasing wages is a way to re prevent the turnover? And yes, you have. We were worried about that turnover issue back in January when the labor was really tight. That was, we were increasing wages because of the turnover and I got to keep them and have the right environment particularly like government. Government was not increasing wages and industry was and they were losing jobs just left and right. So there's that dynamic was going on. That dynamic dropped. Now it is, I'm ready to invest in these other positions that are gonna be critical for me to move forward and keep my cost down, right? It doesn't have to be the highest skilled person right now. This can be down here and I'm gonna do a little bit of training. So it, it's a little bit different than was back in January. So I showed you earlier unemployment claims, we're gonna lose some high skilled wage jobs in Kansas but we're gonna have this upward movement and some lower skilled. So overall, my forecast is flat for wages, unfortunately. Uh, retail sales, it looks positive, and it is positive in some cases, but we were already, the nation was already growing this whole period. We are so far behind. The only demand is all this pent up demand that we didn't go consume, right? We're gonna go and get it consumed once the market starts to really open back up. Uh, businesses, most of them are gonna be, are gonna stay. And you can see quite a few industries saying, oh, we're laying off. It's, layoffs are still happening in Kansas. It's not gonna stop. They still expect it to go. Our forecast, and this is the widest forecast we've ever produced, I just wanna know, but I can't forecast politics and I can't forecast COVID, right? I just, I can't, <laughs> there's. So, so on the bottom, by the way, good judgment. You can see they're forecasting, uh, they're, they're doing a forecast. It's a really interesting one. So on the bottom end, both scenarios, by the way, requires a federal stimulus. If we don't get that soon, it's we're going to go and tank. And it could be, it'd take even longer to get out than us just to get this federal stimulus in. Um, so it's not, you'll get to retire. It's your kids and grandkids. They're the ones that are not going to retire. <laughs> So, no, I, I love it. You keep dialogue, I, I'm good with it. So on the low end, think of it this way. If we have more shutdowns or we really shutter the economy or schools could be the big issue still if people keep talking about that really taking down economies, we have uncertainty because and just negative sentiment because of the presidential election, right? And then we don't have a solution by March my forecast, just to tell you, my model and that and that and it's a kind of metric model, mathematical. It says, "Yope, we're we're decline or flat next year. We we got saw all the growth already. No more." On the other side is we get through this with we get a stimulus package. Households stay positive. They're still consuming because our economy is driven by consumption. They're still consuming. They support those jobs that were hurt earlier, those hardest hit ones, and they keep those jobs flowing. That keeps that got that cash moving through the economy. Uh, we think the economy can grow a lot faster, actually. It can go up to almost 1.1% growth. 
but so in here, the one I'm showing on the left and right in our what we're actually saying is 0.5% uh, growth uh, for this for the Kansas economy. Second quarter is where we think it really will pick up. It'll be past the beginning of the year, and then we'll have a little bit more growth in the economy. And this is not negative, it's just going to slow the growth down. This is more of an accumulative effect on the right side. And the cumulative effect says, hey, we know we're going to be for January, and we shouldn't expect to be where we were in January. That was, that was a good times, right? We're not going to be back to that. So, uh, you know, it's still positive forecast unless we get to this, we have lots of shutdown and contagion and other issues. But we need to plan that in your models your, with your business. Hey, one scenario is we're at the best we're going to be, and it's not going to get better if we have a lot of issues. All right, last act, this paradox of disappointment. Shakespeare really loves to do one thing that's fundamental to human nature. And it's hope. We just it's just hope, and he holds it here, and then just crushes it all the way through. And we enjoy that because it's part of our human nature. It just feels unusual, and that's why we like his, like the plays, right? I won't go that far, but I will tell you this thing. Um, every time I've done these presentations, and I get lots of questions or people asking me which recession best looks like this, and there is not a recession that looks like anything like this. It's just you can't compare. But if I was going to go back, and there is some good similarities to this all the way back to 1340 for the Black Plague. So in the Black Plague, you had economies that lost half of their population. Nowhere near that, but we're losing people. And uh, you had the, you shuttered the economy much more than we did this time. Think about what's going on in the economy in that point in time. You had this feudal system, you had this hierarchy of wealth, and you had this lower class that could not move up. If you're a cobbler, the only way to be a cobbler is you hand it down to your son and your grandson and so forth. They shuttered the economy, people died, and all of a sudden, someone who was a farm hand can now move up and be a cobbler, right? We had the highest income growth in the history of the world, one of the highest income growth in the history of the world during that period. We had the highest upward mobility that we've had in the longest time in the world, and it lasted for almost 100 years, right? So what was the concern we've had about the, uh, the US economy for the last two decades? loss of the middle class, and this income inequality. Look at all the conversations I kept sharing throughout this presentation. There's some, I don't think we're gonna be nearly like the Black Plague, right? We didn't lose a lot of population, that's not the factor. But this movement up of needing some of these other people to move up in their careers, that can grow the economy if we really see that dynamic shift. That income shifts back to different segments and give them opportunity to move up. Those segments that were hurt really hard they find that upward movement that can really change the dynamic. All right, I've talked a lot about in all through the summer, and you might not have heard on the news of, of entrepreneurship and why it would change. I talk about Kansas really being fat and lazy. We have second and third generation businesses and they're just not risk taking anymore. And I won't go on that unless you ask me, but there's just a lot of that that's happened that's really got rid of that dynamism of new entrepreneurs uh, in the state. But what creates, what, what is the factors that would make you more entrepreneurial? Today, you have wealth in your house, that increased. You have income to put in. Wages went up in that second quarter. You have cash on the people were, were capitalized. They could, we have programs to give them cash, right? They just didn't have a reason to do it. They were, had too much cash for them to be motivated before. Now you're starving, the motivation, the hunger is shifted, right? And you can see that. Now, this is just business application. These are not entrepreneurs necessarily. I mean, there, there's more in the entrepreneur system than this. This is year over year, looking at this year by week, and you can see we have big growth in um, new business applications, even once they're already planned wages, right? You're already seeing some of that happening in the state. Going back to this, um, to the Black Plague and what was going on there, what's happened the last two decades, large businesses kept getting bigger, right? They kept controlling all this power. Will that shift? I think that's gonna shift, I'm gonna show you this in the next slide, as a concept. What is another silver lining? The first one, you're pushing back on teleworking. I was waiting to come back to this one. You've, I have, when I did my panel, the businesses that I, I'm, productivity went down for some of my teleworking people. I just didn't like it. But we really need to embrace what, what has shifted in here, this teleworking. You actually just increased your labor pool for those people who have disabilities who couldn't really physically be in your office, those people who don't have cars and vehicles can't come, but they could work, they could actually be very skilled to do it. Remember my regional conversation? Your person is not someone who's here, it's probably someone in another town over. That person is also 
a factor in there, right? You just increased your labor pool. You, cre you got rid of the friction and you can be much faster if you still embrace this. These rules and laws, the best ones tell health. You can now be at home and talk to your doctor and then get paid. What are, we've law, I could put a long list. We've got rid of all these rules of the national and state. state. But think about your company. Think about smaller businesses. Get rid of all those unnecessary rules, the things that were creating friction, not letting you be nimble. And here's a different, if you're nimble and you're, you removed your costs, you got the labor, you already know the new market change and the access to the market so you can react. So smaller businesses have a better opportunity. Entrepreneurs now have a new environment to be more competitive than the large business that had this dominant control over the last two decades. Third one, we had all that software sitting on the shelf we refused to use. COVID hit, we put it into play. Some of us have been kind of given up lately on this, but if we go back to say, let's adapt some of this stuff, increase productivity. This last decade, productivity was so low. I heard you talking about productivity. I don't know if this is what you're talking about. Productivity was so low for the last decade. We were shocked by it. We thought, why, why didn't it go up? It's because we never really adapted to all that software. If we do adapt to that software, I think productivity can go up. And guess what if productivity goes up? This goes back to my point of upward social mobility. Every time productivity goes up, you have more value to that worker now. You're going to move someone up in a new job, right? You could give the other argument, but I think that's the argument we'll see going forward. Yeah. So what does that do to a business or a university that tries to raise money every year? Well, when you're, you know, they're saying, Josh, they don't need to have that new building they built to fix your department. You're going to work all down. So why do I want to give more to the uh, university? So do you, you actually heard we are building a brand new building for our business school. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, I mean, it makes an interesting point from where, I get it, I've been thinking mm -hmm. on YouTube, you brought that up, but you've got other businesses like that where people are working yeah. they don't need to face it. Where about commercial building, uh, real estate? What, what's all this space going to be if nobody starts working? Not everybody, but we're right. small. But I, yeah, sir, I mean, look at all the buildings that Cerner have built throughout in, in our state. There's millions of dollars they've built there, and now they're all working from home, and probably will for maybe forever. So, so, there's, so the, it's a really interesting dynamic. It's more than anything. The question for those people online is that, you know, if all these people do that teleworking and factory, how does that change to commercial real estate demand in some of those markets? And absolutely, I think commercial real estate. Actually, I may have shared, I don't know if I shared it with you in February, but the last two years, we were overbuilt commercial. Oh my, I kept saying that. I mean, even look per capita, per dollar. I mean, every factor, we were overbuilt in commercial. I kept telling that as a warning, saying this is way overbuilt. And, and I, I don't know about your market in particular, but just we keep overbuilding and not des destroying old commercial real estate. It just it should change. Um, so yes, demand's gonna go down in commercial real estate. That's clear. But you, we can't forget this human nature to be socialized and be with people. It doesn't mean we're not gonna be with people. It just means the market just shifted, right? The market shifted away from commercial real estate and having to be physically present. Doesn't mean you're not gonna still have commercial real estate. Doesn't mean we're not gonna interact in other ways. It's just, it's gonna be, it's gonna be different how we interact with each. So it, So the question is, the university is building a new business building, yeah. and what should it, does it need to be as big? Actually, they shrank it down. The offices are teeny, teeny, tiny. They are so small, even on comparison to the rest of the university. We were in a new, we were all, and this is before COVID hit, it was gonna be teeny, teeny, tiny. And what they did add, so all the socializing spaces out in the middle. So we have more conference rooms to come together and collaborate. So all the investment was actually less than your personal office. And it shrank by a lot. I mean, I, I looked at that and like, I don't know if I could work in that. It shrank down a whole lot. It worked out a whole lot. And then, and then it shifted over into these more collaborative spaces. Were we gonna need collaborative spaces? Absolutely. That was it. actually now, now that we look back, it, it was great that they did it because we don't need that big office anymore. Professors don't need that big, they just need just enough, barely fit them, no books. Get rid of your books. We already had, we actually had a conversation last week. <laughs> we had a conversation this last week of how they're gonna encourage them to do recycling to get to reduce books. And I have tons of books in my office right now. The books are out. They're not, they're not gonna allow them to come in there. It just won't fit. 
It's just gonna be enough for you, what, your computer, not a lot of file. There's not even filing anymore. It's just your computer and your student and that's it. That's all that new space is in there, tiny, tiny, tiny spaces. And if you really want to, go into a collaborative space. Don't go in your office. So we, we are actually fitting that model, changing it already. And that will probably happen a lot more. I mean, a lot more in the commercial real estate where I'm just gonna take this office, it's now gonna be split to two and we're gonna cut down our overall space and make more collaborative spaces. All right, I think I need to turn it over. I'm I, we, sorry, I needed to turn it over to you already. Let me Let me move it on. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's what I look like. Uh, well, it's the official college, yeah. Yeah, it works pretty well, so good morning. I'm James Young, I teach at the college economics, and so here for the last couple of years, Jeremy has invited me to come and give the uh, community piece, though often when I'm doing this, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna put some stuff together, he helps me get some data, I kind of think about it, but often I'm like, I know I'm gonna present somebody uh, present I'm so sorry, Darren and Mike. Um, it looks like Jeremy's computer has died. I'm texting him right now to see if <clears throat> if we can get back up at all. He has lost his power cord, unfortunately. So if you bear with me just a minute, I'll see if we can get this back up.
Thanks so much for bearing with us. I've been speaking with Jeremy and it looks like we won't be able to get the webinar back up for James Young's presentation. His presentation is posted on our website um, on the on the community events page. Um, so you can view that presentation there. And I am so, so sorry that we won't be able to uh, broadcast James Young's presentation. If you have any questions or want to drop anything in the chat real quick, uh, I'll stay on for a few more moments. Uh, but other than that, unfortunately, we're, we're done for this morning.